Good morning or good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Genome Webinars. I'm Julia Caro, Managing Editor at Genome Web and Moderator. The title of today's webinar is Maximizing Diagnostic Yield with an Optimist Variant Interpretation Platform. This webinar is sponsored by Condenica. Our speaker today is Catherine Benson, postdoctoral researcher at the Royal College of Surgeons Island. You may type in a question at any time during the webinar, and you can do this through the Q&A panel, which appears on the right side of the webinar presentation. We we'll ask Dr. Benson your questions after the presentation has concluded. Also, if you look at the bottom tray of your window, you will find a series of widgets that can enhance your webinar experience. So with that, let me turn it over to Dr. Benson. Please go ahead. Um, okay, so hello to everyone. Um, as Julia has said, my name is Catherine, and I'm going to talk to you today about our experiences maximizing our diagnostic yield from whole exome sequencing in a cohort of patients who have epilepsy and comorbid intellectual disability. So this work was conducted here at RCSI in Dublin as part of the Science Foundation Ireland Neuro Future Neuro Centre, um, and it was conducted with support from eHealth Ireland and industry partners Congenica. So Congenica was instrumental in this project, and I, I really hope as I go through these slides that I'll be able to demonstrate how we use both our own in-house bioinformatic expertise in combination with Congenica's software to really maximise the benefit of this research testing for our patients. So I think most people who are listening today will be kind of well aware that whole exome sequencing is now a standard clinical test, and it certainly is becoming that in the neurological clinic. Um, and it's being offered to, to many patients in the epilepsy, uh, epilepsy clinic. So it's important that we get the most value from these tests as possible. And by that, we mean that the, the aim is to diagnose as many patients correctly as possible. So there's a few areas that we can look to in order to achieve this. And I'd like to introduce you to the three main considerations that we have found to be most important when aiming to maximize your diagnostic yield in these groups of patients. And I'll refer back to these three considerations throughout the talk. So the first, so what type of sequencing and how the data resulting from the sequencing is processed and filtered. The second consideration is how we link phenotype data that is available to us with our sequencing data. And I think everybody who's listening here now will have a good idea of how important good quality phenotype information is. But I'll go through how that information can directly affect the overall diagnostic yield of your project. And finally, the third consideration is how we interpret our gen genomic results and how we, how we uh, decide whether these variants are indeed the cause of a patient's disease. So during the talk, I'll discuss these considerations in the context of our experience integrating genomics into the epilepsy clinical care pathway in Ireland. So our project, as I, I mentioned already, focuses on genomic testing using whole exome sequencing specifically. And uh, we also used some array CGH in a population of patients who have epilepsy and comorbid intellectual disability, so quite a severe phenotype. We know that most patients who are offered whole exome sequencing uh, in the neurological kind of arena are pediatric patients um, where the diagnostic yield is fairly well established to be about 30%. However, there's considerably less known about the, the uh, diagnostic yield of this type of testing in adult epilepsy patients. So the aim of this project was to incorporate genomic testing into the epilepsy clinical care pathway by establishing a pipeline that goes from recruitment and sampling right through the, to the delivery of results to the patients and their families. So as part of this, we applied both our own in-house bioinformatics pipeline as well as Congenica's analysis platform. And whilst applying this new pipeline, we aim to establish the diagnostic yield in both adult and pediatric patients. So the patients who were recruited to the project all had a clinical diagnosis of epilepsy with no clear cause. So as I mentioned, we recruited both adult and pediatric cases. All of the patients included in the presentation today had comorbid intellectual disability. As the project was conducted as a TRIO study, we required the DNA was available not only from the proband, but also both of their parents. 
None of the patients that we included had prior extensive genetic testing, but anyone who had undergone single gene tests, like a gene test for SEN1A or a small outdated gene panel, were still allowed to be included in the product, project. So um, trios were recruited um, here um, from tertiary referral centres nationwide across the island of Ireland. When patients were recruited, we took two separate blood samples. So one of those blood samples were, was for our research pipeline, which I'll be discussing mostly here, and a second sample was taken to be used in an accredited pipeline if we needed to confirm our research results. So the results from the accredited pipeline could then be used for the return of results to the patients, and this allowed the inclusion of the results from our research study into the patient's clinical record. So it was a really important governance step that we used at the start of the project. So samples underwent whole exome sequencing here in RCSI in Dublin, and in parallel, a RAE CGH was conducted via a service provider. So bioinformatics was conducted via two separate analysis pipelines, as I mentioned. The data was first analysed using the RCSI in-house bioinformatics pipeline, which is done by ourselves, and secondly, using Congenica's online platform. There were some differences between these two analysis pipelines, and I will go into those in a little more detail shortly. Following this uh, initial preliminary analysis, variants were then identified, and, and they were classified here at RCSI in order to identify a list of candidate variants, which would be used for discussion at our Epilepsy Genetics Review Meeting, or EGRM, which I refer to um, as we go through. So this EGRM is conducted using a novel genetics module for our bespoke electronic patient record, or EPR, which is tailor-made for Irish epilepsy patients. So we're very lucky to have this in Ireland. At this meeting, we discuss uh, the candidate variants in the context of this patient's phenotype with input from geneticists, clinical geneticists, epileptologists, bioinformaticians, all sitting around the table. So after discussion, uh, at the Epilepsy Genetics Review Meeting. Variants which are considered to fit the patient's clinical picture and are classified as pathogenic or likely pathogenic, according to guidelines from the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics, or ACMG, are confirmed via this accredited service provider using that second sample. So the sample that's sent to the service provider is that second DNA sample collected at the very start of the project and is completely distinct from the sample used for the research pipeline. Um, for this uh, process, we used CGAT in Germany uh, for confirmation of the results, and CGAT then confirmed not only that the variant was present in the patient sample, but also that our interpretation of the variant was correct. And finally, at the very end of that uh, pipeline, results from the, are returned to the patient and their family or carers, and that's all done uh, via our clinical geneticist. So the first of the three considerations, which I had mentioned at the start of the webinar, um, was when trying to maximize our diagnostic yield, um, we need to consider how we analyze our genomic data. So we used two methods for bioinformatic analysis, as I mentioned, including Congenica's online system. And I'd like to go into a little more detail on how those different analysis methods influenced our diagnostic yield. So this is a detailed slide, bear with me. I want to look at a little more detail of how the pipelines worked and slotted together. So as I mentioned, we recruited, sampled and phenotyped trios from around Ireland. The DNA was extracted and samples were sent to RCSI for analysis. We prepared our libraries here in Dublin using Roche uh, CCAP Easy Exome and then sequenced on the Illumina platform. We used an Illumina NexSeq, which was accessed by UCD in Dublin. The resulting FASTQ files from this Illumina sequencing were analysed as shown here on the left via the RCSI GATK3 based bioinformatics pipeline. The variants were annotated using a NOVAR and they were filtered manually as part of this uh, pipeline. So in parallel on the right, the FASTQ files were also analysed via upload to Congenica. So Congenica processes the samples using a GATK4 based Dragon platform, which also automatically annotated and filtered the re results using Exomizer. So it required considerably less um, manual input. Uh, 
Now, these two different um, analysis pipelines resulted in a slightly different set of qualifying variants um, from the RCSI based platform and the Congenica platform, although with a great, oh, there was a great deal of overlap between both lists. Qualifying variants from both of these bioinformatic pipelines were processed in the same way, with all variants being assessed and classified using the same ACMG guidelines manually here at RCSI. These candidate pathogenic variants were then discussed at the Epilepsy Genetics Review meeting, as I mentioned uh, previously. So following this initial kind of bioinformatic analysis, I mentioned the list of, that a list of qualifying variants were selected. We defined qualifying variants in this study as those which were functional in that they were within an exonic or splicing region of the gene. Qualifying variants also had to be rare in that they had a minor allele frequency of less than 1% in the case of a suspected recessive inheritance pattern or less than 0.1% in the case of a suspected dominant inheritance pattern. In the RCSI pipeline, we defined minor allele frequency using a combination of a number of different uh, population databases, including NOMAD, XSeq, and PropFreak, Max from ANOVA. In contrast, Congenica, the Congenica team focused on the minor allele frequency from NOMAD, which would be kind of the most up-to-date out of those and would be quite a large database. Qualifying variants had to be predicted damaging by polyphen 2, SIFT, or mutation taster. And finally, we only consider qualifying variants within genes that were previously associated with a relevant disease phenotype in OMIM. So we consider genes with a known seizure and or intellectual disability phenotype uh, association on, on that website. So I, I briefly mentioned when I was going through the outline of the study that as well as whole exome sequencing, we conducted some array CGH in our cohort. Now, the reason we did this was due to batch effects between our samples and inherent difficulties in calling CNVs from exome data. Array CGH is still the gold standard method for detecting CNVs, which can be quite difficult to, to call from raw exome data. And from our study in particular, it was, it was difficult because we pooled samples in, in groups of eight, so there was considerable batch effects. Um, we conducted this array CGH in 80 of our patients from this cohort using Agilent SureTag and Human Genome Array Microarray Kits. So much in the same way as the SNVs, which were identified from our whole exome sequencing pipelines, array, um, or sorry, ACMG uh, pathogenicity guidelines were used to assess the pathogenicity of our CNV events. So the ACMG um, have published SNV guidelines, but also CNV guidelines, so we, we use those. And we considered variants uh, which were within um, OMIM morbid genes associated with neurological disease and generally greater than one megabase. And we required that um, three or, or less similar size variants were present in DGV uh, control databases in the region that we had our candidate variant so that we were sure that the, the variant that we were looking at was indeed rare in the general population. Um, so in terms of the analysis that we ran on Congenica, we uploaded 110 patient trios uh, to Congenica for bioinformatic analysis, and these were also analyzed using our RCFI pipeline. So this was done so that we could maximize the diagnostic yield by using a combination of analysis approaches. So this combination of analysis pipelines succeeded in identifying novel variants in patients unsolved in our in-house pipeline alone and actually boosted our diagnostic yield by 3%, which is actually very important, um, particularly to the patients who, who, who did receive a diagnosis through Congenica. So the reason for the identification of new variants using the second Congenica pipeline was probably due to differences in how the data was analyzed, which was our first consideration on how to boost diagnostic yield, which I mentioned at the start of the webinar. So Congenica uses a more up-to-date version of GATK, GATK4, as distinct from our in-house pipeline, which uses GATK3. So Congenica also uses Dragon for sample processing and filters the resulting variants using a different set of criteria than we use at RCSI. And finally, Congenica prioritizes candidate variants using ExoMizer, which is not used in our laboratory um, pipeline. So it, it prioritizes variants which are a, a good phenotype match. So moving on to our second consideration, um, which was when we're trying to maximize our diagnostic yield, how we link 
gene genomic and phenotype data. So once we have our candidate variants following bioinformatic processing and annotation, these variants need to be considered in the context of the patient's phenotype. And there are a number of ways in, in which we can do this. Um, so as part of our study, uh, candidate variants were discussed at our epilepsy genetics review meeting. And this was facilitated by the genomics module, which was developed as part of the epilepsy electronic health record as part of the study. The variants uh, for discussion were uploaded to the ele electronic record, allowing quick access to both the genomic data as well as a wealth of clinical phenotype information directly at the meeting. The genomic results were discussed in the context of this clinical picture um, with in input from the geneticists as well as the clinicians and the bioinformaticians. Because the data was available through this electronic portal, this facilitated remote input from referring clinicians around the country who were unable to physically travel to Dublin for the meeting. So this was almost the equivalent of having the patient's neurologist in the room with us and provided even more detail to the notes, the extensive notes that were present in the electronic patient record alone. And this helped us to make molecular diagnoses which would not have been possible otherwise. And I'll give actually an example of one case where that was particularly important uh, towards the end of the talk. So in parallel, um, the Congenica system uses another method for linking genotype and phenotype information, which was really valuable as part of this project. So human phenotype ontology, or HPO terms, which describe relevant phenotype features can be integrated into the Congenica system in order to automate and speed up the interpretation of genomic results. So there's an effort underway by our group and Ingo Helbig's group to develop HBO terms for epilepsy. And this is something that Congenica are also helping us with, which is really, really valuable. Um, the limitation to using these HBO-based systems alone is that incorporation of the HBO terms requires a coded clinical record, which isn't always available and can lead to, to limited data. Um, we have found, however, that when using Congenica and these HBO terms, there are huge advantages to using the terms to integrate phenotype data and prioritize our results. It reduces the number of variants to assess, um, as generally the pathogenic variant is identified faster when these results are prioritized in this manner, which reduces the hands-on time required um, by the technician. So it's really, really valuable in that way. And I think the HBO terms are certainly the way of the future, and we should, we should really start to consi consider using these coded um, bits of information um, in, our, in our clinical records. It's, it's, it's certainly very important in terms of our bioinformatics. Um, so the third uh, consideration um, when looking to try and maximize our diagnostic yield is how we interpret our genomic results. So the standard method for interpreting uh, the pathogenicity of candidate genomics variants, and certainly the one that's, that's very well established, um, is the implementation of guidelines which are provided by the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics, or ACMG. So these guidelines assign a standardized level of evidence-based pathogenicity. So there's five different levels of pathogenicity, which range from benign all the way through to pathog likely pathogenic and pathogenic. And likely pathogenic and pathogenic would be considered as clinically important. And there are the levels um, of pathogenicity that we would report back uh, to a patient and their family. So the evidence uh, used uh, to contribute to the pathogenicity score includes the type of variant. So is the variant a stop gain variant, a missense variant, a splicing variant? And um, previous reports about the variant, including those which would be listed on the ClinVar or OMIM databases. And um, we would also look to evidence um, uh, on the minor allele frequency of the variant, often as, as detailed in NOMAD, for example. And the inheritance uh, pattern of the variant and how, how it's, it's moving through the family and the location of the variant where it falls within the, the protein. So these ACMG guidelines are extremely useful to us to standardize variant classification and particularly across lab groups and service providers. But unfortunately, the interpretation of the ACMG guidelines still varies considerably from group to group and, and can leave them open to, to, to some, some improvements, I think, in the future. Um, so I think what we're all interested in, I'd, I'd like to go through the results of our study, which were, were directly impacted by these three considerations which I've outlined. So we discussed um, 
101 uh, trios at our epilepsy genetics review meeting um, to date. And that we're having new meetings uh, weekly or fortnightly at the moment. So 74 of these probands um, that we've discussed so far were adult epilepsy patients and 27 were pediatric epilepsy patients. So overall, when we take all of these patients together, we had a diagnostic rate of 33% in the adult and pediatric groups together. Within the adult patients alone, the diagnostic rate was 30%, and in the pediatric patients, it was 41%. And although this is a slight nominal difference, it wasn't significant. So this demonstrated that the yield was comparable between the two groups and shows the value of this type of testing in both adult and pediatric epilepsy patients with comorbid ID. So it's particularly noteworthy that by utilizing Congenica for analysis, we identified two novel variants in three separate patients. So this represented a boost in overall yield from 30 to 33%. That's hugely valuable to us. These variants were within the genes SDXBP1 and ANK or D11, and these are both well-established seizure-associated genes that were not identified when we ran them through our RCSI pipeline. Um, the diagnostic uh, variants which we identified were de novo in 82% of cases, with the variant by being identified in the proband, but not in either parent. And remember, this was a trio study, so we had exome sequencing data on the parents as well as the index cases. Two of our patients received a diagnosis as a result of array CGH testing, which was not identifiable using the exome data. So, as a result, 2.5% of patients from our cohort had an epilepsy phenotype as a result of a CNV or a copy number variant, which is pretty much in line with, with previous reports and the rate we would, we would generally expect. It's worth noting as well that we consented adult patients in our study for the receipt of clinically actionable incidental findings as, as recommended by the ACMG, and they have kind of a list of genes in which they would consider um, a finding to be clinically actionable. So we followed, followed those guidelines and only in adult patients who were, who were consented at the very start of the project. So two patients representing 2.7% of the adult cohort carried an incidental finding which was reported back to them by the clinical geneticist. So these variants were within the genes KCNH2 and KCNQ1, both of which are associated with different forms of long QT syndrome. So these genes do actually have a, a, some form of seizure phenotype, but, but would not explain the full severe epilepsy syndrome that we saw in, in these patients. So we think it's not the, the cause. It is definitely an incidental, an incidental finding. So here I have in a table, this may be a little difficult to read, uh, the full list of genes in which a diagnostic variant was identified. So I'm sure that a number of these gene names are familiar to those of you with any knowledge of, of epilepsy genetics. We observed uh, a number of siblings who shared the same diagnostic variants, as you can see here. And three patients had CHD2 variants, which were identified, um, who shared very similar clinical features as identified by our clinical geneticists at the EGRM. So these were three patients who were unrelated and had different variants within that same gene. So despite having all these different variants within CHD2, all three patients had a seizure onset of between th ages three and four. They had very mild intellectual disability, and all of them had some uh, autism uh, spectrum features. Finally, we identified variants in SCN1A, which is a very well-recognized um, epilepsy gene, as well as TSC1, which may have some impact on patient care. For the other patients with a molecular diagnosis, this can open up, even if they, it's not directly going to impact on their care, it can open up this whole world of, of support groups in clinical trials to these patients and their families once they're armed with a specific molecular diagnosis. And this is often of immense value to these families who often have been living for, for a very long time without any idea of actually exactly what is causing this, this debilitating disease. So I'm going to go through a couple of examples here of some patients. These are real life patients whose molecular diagnoses have been directly impacted um, by how we have uh, tackled the three considerations for maximizing diagnostic yield, which I, which I mentioned already. So the first consideration which I had mentioned was how we analyze our genomic data and it directly impacted on, on this pair of twin girls who were recruited to our project. 
So these, these girls are, are monozygotic twins. They're, they're aged 17 and they both suffer from idiopathic generalized epilepsy with generalized tonic-clonic as well as absence seizures. So both sisters have quite mild intellectual disability, but they met all their early milestones despite being a little slow to reach them. Um, now at the moment, they're both attending mainstream, uh, mainstream schooling. Um, the results from MRI uh, on both girls w was, was normal and that was listed in their electronic uh, health records. Um, at the time of the girl's birth, um, their mum was 33 years old and their dad was, was 38. So this is their pedigree chart showing the two sisters down at the bottom, um, uh, row 3, um, individuals 12 and 13. You can see here there is some family history of migraine on the mother's side and there's one aunt with epilepsy on that side of the family tree, but there's no um, considerable family history otherwise, um, which would be noteworthy. So both sisters underwent uh, whole exome sequencing in array CGH using the, the pipeline which we've already gone through. Um, this uh, whole exome sequencing um, was analysed first using the RCSI in-house pipeline, but we didn't identify any diagnostic variant from, from that pipeline. The sisters were then um, reanalyzed using the Congenica pipeline and using this analysis tool, a variant was identified. You can see this here in the uh, screenshot uh, from Congenica's site. Um, this variant was in ANK or D11. So you can see this is quite a clean call as shown on the right here. And this was a missense de novo variant. So it wasn't seen in the sequence data from either parent, parent and it was absent from the control populations completely. Um, ANK uh, or D11 is associated with KBG syndrome, which is characterized by distinctive facial features, which were quite evidently seen in both of these sisters. It's also characterized by short stature, skeletal anomalies, neurological invo invo involvement consistent with the patient's phenotype, which I had mentioned. So we discussed these patients uh, in depth at the Epilepsy Genetics Review meeting, and we decided that this variant, according to ACMG, would be considered pathogenic. When we looked, looked back, we saw that the reason that this variant was identified using Congenica and not our in-house pipeline was probably due to differences in how the variants were filtered. So the in-house pipeline at RCSI threw this variant out as it didn't reach the cutoff point for the genotype quality score. Congenica uses a more up-to-date classification system for variants, which made sure that this diagnostic variant wasn't removed prematurely, and it meant that we could identify uh, the cause of this, these sisters' disease. So a second case where um, uh, we had a direct impact um, by how we analyzed our data was in this female patient who is aged nine years old. Um, this nine-year-old patient didn't have any family history of epilepsy, but does have a clinical diagnosis of symptomatic generalized epilepsy cause unknown. So at birth, this, this wee girl um, had what her mother described as a big head and was seven pounds and eight ounces. She had considerable feeding difficulties as a baby, and although her development was described as normal, she was late to crawl and slow to walk. From 18 months, she began to regress, and currently, this female patient is tall, overweight for her age, and is currently, unfortunately, nonverbal. So this is the patient's pedigree chart, um, and although there is an aunt on her mother's side with kind of mild intellectual disability, there's no uh, family history of epilepsy, and no family members with any kind of comparable disease phenotype. So although no variant was identified for this patient from whole exome sequencing analysis using either pipeline, a variant was identified in this patient using a Ray CGH. So the variant is shown here on the right, a 200 KB deletion um, with 60, uh, within uh, 16P11.2. Uh, so this region is associated with an established deletion syndrome, which is very much consistent with this patient's phenotype. So patients with uh, 16P11.2 deletions tend to have de developmental delay and intellectual disability, impaired communication, delayed speech and language development, which are all very consistent with the, the, the clinical picture for this patient. The patients often have recurrent seizures and are at risk for, for obesity, which again is, is in line with what, what we're, we're seeing in this, this nine-year-old girl. So when classified for pathogenicity using the ACMG guidelines for CNVs specifically, 
this variant was classified as likely pathogenic um, and was confirmed as pathogenic by our accredited service provider, CGAT. So we suggest that this variant was inherited as a de novo event, uh, but the parents actually haven't undergone a race CGH in this, in this case as of yet. Um, further detail on this variant is shown here. Um, when we return to the whole exome data after identifying the variant through race CGH, we were able to use read depth depth uh, based analysis to confirm the results that we saw from the array CGH. The use of the array CGH in this case to analyze the data was really, really valuable as the batch effects wouldn't have allowed us to identify this result from the exome data alone. So in the future, new CNV callers and whole genome sequencing or higher throughput sequencing will improve NGS-based CNV uh, calling quality. So the second uh, consideration uh, which we find important for improving diagnostic yield was how we link genotype and phenotype data. So this was important in this case here of a male patient with symptomatic generalized epilepsy. So the patient suffered from generalized tonic-clonic and absence seizures and had some family history of epilepsy and intellectual disability. The patient himself had severe intellectual disability and autism as well as challenging uh, and self-injury -in uh, behavior. So as well as these neurological features, the patient had comorbid conditions including renal failure, hepatic disease, hypertension, lung modules, and, and the patient had a number of uh, sclerotic lesions uh, in his colon. Um, we can see here the, the patient's um, pedigree chart, and as I mentioned, on the father's side, there's some history of epilepsy and intellectual disability, um, but no history of, of seizures marked here uh, in black. So, following bioinformatic analysis, the variant was identified using both pipelines in TSC1. So this stop gain variant was absent from control databases and had a de novo transmission, uh, so it wasn't present in either of the patient's parents' data. So TSC1, as I'm sure many of you are aware, is associated with tuberous sclerosis, and uh, this is a multi-system disorder which is consistent with the features which I had mentioned in the patient's clinical record. However, very importantly, TSC is characterized by uh, a very specific skin hamartomas, which are often quite prominent. Um, when discussing the variant at the Epilepsy Genetics Review meeting, there were a number of uh, clinicians who were very reluctant to accept TSC as a diagnosis without any mention of these skin hamartomas in the patient's record. So this prompted a considerable um, uh, clinical review by our advanced nurse practitioner as part of our research team. Uh, so Maura uh, met the patients and his parents and told the, the parents when she met them, told them that there was something funny about the patient's feet. So Maura at this meeting with the parents took a look and, and found ungal fibromas on all 10 of the patient's toes, which hadn't been noticed by the patient's neurological team previously. This then really cemented the TSC1 uh, variant as pathogenic as it tied the full clinical picture with uh, the genotype together. Without the epilepsy genetics review meeting and the ability to feed back to the, the neurologist and, and the advanced nurse practitioner to get a really truly detailed, updated clinical information, we wouldn't have been able to provide this patient with a molecular diagnosis, even though we had really good genomic results. So our final consideration was how we interpret uh, our results, and this was a really important factor in, in this case here. So this was a, a male patient uh, who was born uh, through a normal birth despite uh, quite prolonged labor. The patient has generalized epilepsy, um, and this began at about age three with the onset of seizures. The patient has mild intellectual disability, but met all of his early milestones, and, and currently the patient is now in, in residential service. He has microcephaly, he has hypothyroidism, dysmorphic features, which include low set ears, quite a narrow nose and a narrow face. Um, the patient also has cerebellar hyperplasia, um, and his mum was 29 years old uh, when he was born, and the dad was 35. So we'll have a look here at the patient's pedigree chart, and there, there was quite obviously no clear uh, family history of epilepsy or uh, intellectual disability, quite, quite, quite relatively clean. So as, as a result of the whole exome analysis using both pipelines, we identified this variant in OPHN1, 
It was identified in the proband and was um, inherited from his mum. So this variant was absent from the population databases um, and was previously unreported in ClinVar or OMIM. So we know that OPHN1 is associated with an X-linked mental retardation syndrome in which patients have cerebellar hyperplasia and very distinctive facial features which were consistent with those that we saw in our patient. Our clinical geneticist believes quite certainly that this is an excellent genotype phenotype match. However, when we classify using these ACMG guidelines, unfortunately, the variant was classified as a variant of unknown significance on the basis of the evidence that we have available to us. At the moment, we're trying to gather further evidence to try and push this over the line because we are quite certain that this is probably the cause of the patient's um, disease, but we can't, uh, on the basis of the knowledge that we have at the moment, report that back to the patient, and it remains a, a variant of unknown significance. So in summary, three considerations are important when we're embarking on a study to try to improve our diagnostic yield. So firstly, we should try to consider what tools uh, we use for genomic uh, data analysis. So here as part of this study, we use both an in-house bioinformatic pipeline, which was run uh, using GATK3, as well as using GAT, uh, Congenica, which is, uses GATK4. Now we found that both these methods were, were effective individually, but our yield was really maximized by using a combination of both. So using Congenica as well as our own pipeline boosted our yield by 3%. Um, so even though we're a lab with, with pretty good um, um, bioinformatics expertise, we still found huge benefit to, to using a system like Congenica. So which type of pipeline we use will generally be influenced by the resources that we have available to us. For example, if you have bioinformaticians available, bioinformaticians will be comfortable using a coded pipeline, whereas medical staff without any kind of bioinformatic training may not be able to use these methods and they may not have the, tr the advanced training required to use these methods. Um, a bioinformatician will often be more comfortable using a coded pipeline because it gives a little bit more control over how the pipeline is run exactly, when samples are run and this kind of thing, um, whereas there is a lot more support offered through tools like Congenica um, to, to facilitate the analysis and often speed it up as well. So the type of pipeline may also that you choose may also affect how your variants will be filtered, and we should really consider this as well at the, the outset of our study. So with a custom pipeline, you may have more control, as I mentioned, over these filtering options, but some level of control is also available using Congenica's settings, which they have developed. So as such, we should consider inheritance patterns and the disease in question when we're setting these thresholds at the very start of the study. And this leads us into our second consideration, the good phenotype data makes the genetic data even more valuable. And I think that any, anyone who's embarked on this kind of study will tell you that your genomic analysis is really only as good as the phenotype information you are given and how you can link the two together. So we've certainly found from our experience that interdisciplinary expertise is absolutely invaluable and the key to improving our diagnostic yield. HPO terms can be really valuable for the automation of bioinformatic analysis and to speed up the time that it takes to reach that diagnos diagnosis. But there are some challenges around the incorporation of these tools and e-health records should continue to be coded as standard with these HPO terms as we move forward with electronic um, health tools and specific HPO terms for epilepsy are also going to be really, really useful in the coming years. So finally, our third consideration, the interpretation of genomic variants. So we, we have seen considerable variation in the interpretation of standardized guidelines from the ACMG between group to group and between service providers. And in order to improve these extremely valuable guidelines, it's important that they continue to evolve as we gather new evidence. For example, it may be useful to consider the incorporation of MTR scoring in the future into these, into these um, guidelines. So uh, to start wrapping up, I'd like to thank everyone who is listed on the slide, uh, including my PI, uh, Gian Piero Cavallari and Norman Delante, um, as well as the Congenica team for allowing me uh, to speak at this webinar today. Um, um, I would also like to thank the patients in particular and their families for contributing to this project, um, and they, they really we couldn't do any of this work without, uh, without these, these people. Lastly, I'd like to thank all at the SFI Future Neuro team and our funders who are listed here. Um, we'll soon be um, putting out a paper describing this work. It's in the works at the moment. Um, and in the meantime, I'd like uh, to answer any questions that anybody, anybody has. Thank you very much.
Okay, thank you so much, Catherine, for this nice presentation. As a reminder, if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A panel. And also, we would like to ask our participants to take a brief moment after the webinar has ended to take our exit survey and give us your feedback. So with that, let us go into questions. Yes, yeah, so you mentioned that there were a couple of variants you found by using Congenica that you wouldn't have found with your own uh, pipeline alone. But mm -hmm. is the, the reverse also true? Are there any variants you detected um, by manual filtering without using co Congenica? And the vast majority of variants were also identified for, uh, by Congenica that we had found in our uh, in our in-house pipeline. Yeah, it was it was pretty good. The overlap was, as I mentioned, very very strong. Okay, thanks. A uh, quick technical question: Somebody wants to know why you didn't use HG thirty eight in the analysis. Yeah, good question. Um, we used HG nineteen because that's what a lot of our our tools are kind of kind of made to use. Um, as the tools kind of develop and start to move over to build 38, we'll certainly start to, 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 to do that also. But at the moment, we're sticking with uh, HD19 because it's, it's the one that's supported by the most of the tools that we use for our bioinformatic analysis. OK, thanks. Um, did you also try looking only at the patient, the index case, and not the parents, and see whether there was a difference from the trio results? So not really. When we when we ran it, what we would do was I would have a look at the ProBands information, um, develop kind of a list of candidate variants based on that, and then we would look at the inheritance for those candidate variants. So things weren't thrown out if they weren't seen in the parents. And we did go back and look at kind of raw data, BAM files, um, for the, pa the parents at the locus that we were interested in, where we had identified a variant in the proband. So it was kind of done as a, as a process. We didn't specifically look um, at the yield without looking at the parents and then look at it with the parents. So that's something that might be interesting to do. Okay, thank you. Um, in addition to ClinVar, did you also use HGMD Pro? And what did you do when there was little or conflicting data only available in ClinVar? Um, so we didn't use HGMD Pro. We used ClinVar mainly, but I, as we all know, you know, there's there's kind of varying levels of of quality data in ClinVar, so we did tend to take um, the the records on there with 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 kind of you know a, a kind of a, a certain amount of kind of weighting of evidence. Um, when we discussed the variants at our epilepsy genetics review meeting, um, we very much were very quite conscious of um, if the pay the variant had been reported before, mentioning had it be, in what um, manner had it been reported in ClinVar, was it reported in a paper, you know, and going through kind of the evidence in, in, in detail. Um, but no, we haven't, haven't used that tool. That's something that we may consider in the future. Okay, thanks. A couple of questions relating to the laboratory that confirmed the variants for you, and that is mm -hmm. what sequencing technique did that lab use? So CGAT was the, the name of the accredited service provider. Um, so when we sent off um, a variant for confirmation, they would just sanger the exact position that we were interested in just to confirm that it was correct. And as we know, Sanger is kind of the gold standard method still probably for it to be quite confident in a, a standard germline call. Um, so it was confirmed by Sanger using CGAT, and then they would use the same ACMG kind of um, established guidelines um, to confirm our interpretation of the result. But it was also done using a clinical geneticist service um, through them as well. Right, okay. And then a related question, how did CGAT's diagnostic reports compare to your own reports or the ones with your own and congenicals pipeline? Good question. Um, it was very, very high concordance. Um, we found that anything that we were sending off, we were pretty pretty confident in, um, and, and they tended to agree with us. There might have been one or two cases where we sent off something that we were a little less confident or, or let, less sure on. There may have been two cases, and they came back and said they agreed with us that they also wouldn't be confident enough, and we had to, to remain uh, keep that variant as a variant of unknown significance, like that OPH and one variant, which I'd mentioned. Okay, 
Uh, did you submit any of your new variants to any of the databases? Um, I'm actually in the process of uploading them to ClinVar this week, actually, so they should be up uh, shortly. Okay, that's uh, great to hear. Um, let me see what else we have here. What software or databases do you think are useful to link variants to genes, just generally speaking? What do you mean, how to link uh, link genes? To uh, that's link the, 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 to? the the question says, um, what software databases do you think are useful to link variants to genes? Um, well, the way we, we would have identified um, or annotated our variants um, would have been using the ANOVA tool, which we found very useful for, for finding which, um, which gene a variant was within. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of questions relating to the examples you provided. One is mm -hmm. in the last example, was the mother tested for a skewed inactivation since she did not present with the same symptoms as her son? Um, so she wasn't. The thought was that um, because it was an X-linked condition, um, the mother had, um, you know, t two copies of X, and, and therefore, it, it, I, I, you know, it is actually very possible that she had an activation on the other on the other X chromosome, but we haven't tested it yet, and it's something we should really look into, or to see if she has um, an indel which wasn't picked up, uh, or a, a small CNV which wasn't uh, obviously picked up from the exome data on the other chromosome. It's quite possible. Okay, and another question about the um, TSC1 case, and the question is, um, yeah. That finding was discarded until a familiar phenotype was observed. Um, why did the physicians insist on seeing a familiar phenotype um, to decide that this variant is causative? Um, I mean, it's, it's an ongoing discussion. You know, we wouldn't have probably thrown it out completely. It would. It, it just, you know, really cemented the diagnosis for us and gave us a little bit more confidence. You know. Um, the patient hadn't been linked to TSC previously, and I think it already reached adulthood, so the clinicians were kind of not too confident in a diagnosis of TSC until the ungual fibromas really, really cemented it for them and kind of really, really drove it home. All right. A um, couple of questions again about the pipelines, um, the two different pipelines, Congenica and your own. Is there mm -hmm. a difference in turnaround time between the two? Um, it depends um, because obviously we're a research-based lab. It's kind of um, it's dependent on kind of other things that are going on in the lab, the speed that we can get th samples through our own pipeline. Um, sometimes it's faster, sometimes it's slower. We have found that once a sample, if we try to go as fast as we can, the congenic uh, process tends to be faster um, just because uh, our own pipeline, the way it's set up, um, is using kind of our own servers and stuff. And the, the Dragon system used by Congenica does tend to be much faster. Okay. And then mm -hmm. um, just to reiterate, you might have mentioned it a little bit before, was there a significant difference in the number of variants that each pipeline generated? I guess you said that there wasn't, right? Mm -hmm. um, no, it's pre pretty comparable, really. Um, yeah, pretty, pretty comparable. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, have you considered any other alternative methods for confirming your variants besides Sanger sequencing? Um, we haven't really up until now, um, but we're open to suggestions. Okay, sounds good. And here's something relating to the ACMG guidelines. Um, mm -hmm. Did you use the Sherlock classification? Um, the that doesn't want to know because you've mentioned that the ACMV guidelines are insufficient in interpre interpreting certain variants, especially X-linked mm -hmm. ones. Um, so we use just the standard uh, ACMG uh, CM guidelines, um, um, the ones that were published in 2015. Um, 
that that they're the ones that we're using at the moment. Um, we have found, you know, particular difficulties with mis sense variants that haven't been um, reported before in the literature and um, that are kind of novel variants. They can be particularly difficult to, to get over the, the threshold. Um, but I mean, as I, I said in the, in the talk, they, they really are completely invaluable um, and, and really do standardise between lab laboratories. Um, but yeah, always room for improvement. Okay, okay. Um, about the sequencing part of the NAS, the exome sequencing, from your experience, what depth of coverage would you recommend for a clinical whole genome exome, se exome sequencing test? Um, we use about 50x and we found that to be pretty reliable. Uh, you can go down to about 30x, uh, probably be pretty okay, um, but, but 50x is nice, pretty good. Okay. And here's a really specific question. Did you use GATK's VQSR tool? Uh, I don't think we did, no. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also, is there any open source software that you can recommend that is a bit like Exomizer? Um, and is any other code uh, useful for HPO for epilepsy? Um, it's something, it, it, they feel free to pass the person on to me to, uh, to go into that in a little more in detail. Uh, at the moment, mm -hmm. we don't use any, any um, open source um, version of Exomizer. We, we just use ourselves <laughs> to do it <laughs> right, yeah. uh, manually. Um, but yeah, it would be great to have an open source version of it. But we, we don't at the moment. We found Exomizer using that through Congenic to be really good. Um, yeah, I can't remember what the second part of that question was. Um, whether there's any other code besides those for HPO that's useful for epilepsy? Um, there are a number of um, HPO type kind of tools that you can use. Um, I'm not familiar with, with them in depth myself. Uh, one of my colleagues would certainly be able to, to talk to talk to the, the um, listener about that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how did you decide on a, a particular in silico prediction tool for the variant interpretation and classification? So we tried to use a combination for our, our own pipeline because, as we kind of would know, there's you know can, can sometimes be considerable variability um, between them. We, we tended to use um, Polyfen SIFT, a mutation taster, and at least two of them called the variant uh, as pathogenic. We chose them because we're familiar with them and they, they're kind of well established uh, and often cited, so we were quite comfortable using them. Um, and they're tools that are available to us. Uh, to integrate uh, to the ANOVA output, which, which is useful. Okay. Um, finally, about the report to, to clinicians and patients, did you tell the family about the mode of transmission and did you add that information to the report directly? Um, yes, we would have included information on transmission generally. Um, as I mentioned, that was all um, done through our clinical geneticist who kind of has many years experience with this and, and, and was very comfortable feeding back um, the data to, to the patients. Um, yeah, they found it very useful actually and there was a number of patients actually asked for cascade testing as well for other family members who were considering family planning issues, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Got it. Okay. Here's another um, very technical question that just came in. So for clinical whole exome sequencing, would you recommend performing variant calling using a BED file to subset on targeted regions or calling variants in the whole genome? Um, so we, what we tended to do because we were looking for molecular diagnoses for these patients was that we looked specifically at um, genes that were associated with a seizure or intellectual disability phenotype. So we looked at everything pretty much whole genome to start, or whole exome to start, um, and kind of threw out anything that wasn't um, linked to a kind of a disease gene in OMEM um, that was 
in one of those phenotypes. So essentially we were limiting it by a, a kind of a bed file. And um, the reason we did that was because it was going to be pretty impossible for us to, in, this, in the context of this study here, it is something that we're interested in in the future, to look at, at new genes or novel genes which haven't previously been associated with an epilepsy seizure or intellectual disability phenotype. Um, so I suppose we, we did limit uh, in that manner, yeah. Okay, great, yeah. And a um, couple of questions about your study in general. So you saw a large number of de novo variants, 82%. Was that surprising at all? And what proportion of those were predicted to be loss of function variants? So um, the de novo rates for this kind of disease, epilepsy and, and, and intellectual disability, are kind of previously established to be very high. So we weren't shocked. It was still a little high, but we, we you know, it's pretty much in line with, with what we would have expected for the kind of patient cohort that we had. Um, in terms of variants being loss of function, um, about overall, about 40% of the variants from the study were loss of function, and of the de novo variants, about 35% of those would have been loss of function. Okay, great. Um, and to select the qualifying variants that you discussed, how did you choose the disease-associated genes? Did you use, for example, Genomic England's panel app for that? No, we, we, didn't, um, we didn't use that panel app. We looked at pretty much all of the, the, the spectrum of genes, as I, as I mentioned, limiting to those with a known uh, seizure or intellectual disability phenotype. Um, and if we didn't see anything, first of all, we would look at a kind of a list of genes that, that kind of we're familiar with or we would have used as a gene panel previously, limited to those which are kind of very well established seizure epilepsy phenotype uh, genes. If we didn't find anything uh, using that kind of, I suppose, panel, which would be comparable, we then expanded to any other genes which had been associated with uh, a seizure or ID phenotype in OMEM. Okay, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And you mentioned that your diagnostic rate overall was 33%. Uh, what is your best mm -hmm. guess what the disease cause was for the others? Oh, that's a difficult question. Um, it could, <laughs> um, well, it could be a, a number of things. There's a couple of patients who didn't have an array CGH yet. It could, could, could be copy number variants in those patients. could be multi-genic uh, effects, either um, polygenic kind of disorders um, or, or just genes that we, we don't know to be associated with the, an epilepsy phenotype yet. Right, yeah. Um, mm. Finally, at the EGRM meetings, what kinds of clinical experts were usually present? So the bioinformaticians, um, including myself, who have processed the data, uh, would be at the meeting. We have geneticists, clinical geneticists, including the clinical geneticist, who would feed back the um, data to the patients or the results to the patients. We have our advanced nurse practitioner. Um, we have epileptologists the neurologists, often the referring neurologist uh, who in, recruited the patient to the study, as I mentioned, would call in or attend the meeting as well, which is really valuable. Often we'd have uh, medical students as well uh, at the meeting um, and our PhD students. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, other questions just came in uh, again about the selection of uh, the genes you selected for analysis. Did you include mm -hmm. genes that are linked to metabolic disease that present with epilepsy? Yes, we would have included those genes for sure. Yeah, yeah, they were included. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. And then a question about potentially using a different type of array. Would a high resolution array that targets known epilepsy genes help to pick up some exon level deletions or duplications that might have been missed by the standard arrays and sequencing? Quite possibly. Yeah, quite possibly. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then finally, so you talked about the ACMG guidelines having some limitations. What are your suggestions mm -hmm. for changing them? Um, I kind of touched on this a little bit, but um, I think using something like the MTOR scoring to help with the missense variance, um, the MTOR scoring missense tolerance ratio, which was um, pioneered by Slavoj Petrovsky and his group, um, could be really useful um, just to help uh, kind of push those missense variants, which kind of are, are quite you know, quite tempting to call pathogenic, but remain variants of unknown significance may be helpful and may help to separate out the uh, true uh, pathogenic variants from the variants of unknown significance. Okay, very good. Uh, 
it turns out this is actually all the questions we have. And we also have three Great. top of the hour. So thank you very much. Let me thank no our problem. speaker, Catherine Benson, and our sponsor, Congenica. And again, as a quick reminder, please look out for the survey after you log out to provide us with your feedback. And finally, if you missed any part of this webinar or you would like to listen to it again, a link to an archived version will be emailed to all participants. So with that, thank you very much again for attending this genome webinar.